This is not just another book chat podcast. Lifelong reader Cindy Rollins joins teachers Angelina Stanford and Thomas Banks for an ongoing conversation about the skill and art of reading well. Explore the lost intellectual tradition and discover how to fully enter into the great works of literature. Learn what books mean while delighting in the sheer joy of imagination. Each week, we will rescue story from the ivory tower and bring it to your couch, your kitchen, and your commute. The literary life is for everyone, because in the words of Stratford Caldecott, to be enchanted by story is to be granted a deeper insight into reality. Join us for an ever unfolding discussion of how stories will save the world. This is the Literary Life Podcast. Welcome to the Literary Life Podcast. I'm Angelina Stanford, and I am joined, as always, by my partner in crime and partner in all things literary, the increasingly less mysterious Mr. Banks. Hello, Mr. Banks. Miss Stanford. <laughs> but today, we are here with someone who I know the crowd will be roaring when they hear this. Welcome back, Cindy Rollins. It's very good to be here. And I, I didn't know Mr. Banks was less mysterious. So yes, since you've been on your strange. sabbatical, he's just he's just like transparent now. Yeah, I know. We're we're trying desperately to stop this from becoming the yeah, the the unwarranted confessions of Thomas Banks. <laughs> Well, Cindy, I'm thrilled you're here today. Today's topic is why read biographies? And I begged her to come back. Be please, please take a sabbatical from your sabbatical and come and be on this episode because I don't know that I have too much to say on this topic, but Cindy and Mr. Banks are, are both great lovers of biographies and, and read a ton of them. And I'm excited. I'm excited to do this episode today. We've we've had a lot of questions about it, a lot of requests and and I'm kind of curious too what what we're, what we're going to say is the role of the biography in in the literary life. But uh, we'll be getting to that in in just a minute. But first, Cindy, you just finished up your summer long everything, right? Your discipleship class, your narration boot camps. Yeah, I finished uh, our the back to school conference. We finished the the I had three uh, narration classes going: an adult one, a middle school one, and a high school one. And finished those up. And I'm ready for a long winter's nap of reading <laughs> and drinking tea and that sort of thing. <laughs> long winter's nap. And if our listeners are just missing you so terribly, and I know they are, but where, where can they find you? Well, they can find me on my Patreon. I spend a lot of time with my Patreons. We do a lot over there. We have two monthly Zoom meetings and uh, we read through Charlotte's volumes. We're doing school education right now. So um, the bulk of my not busy season is spent on the Patreon. And it, it's it's a great place. It, it, we I just have lovely moms over there. And um, we just spend a lot of time with them. Well, I'm I'm glad you've been doing that. Of course, you've still got your uh, the new Mason Jar podcast. Oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm such wanna... a great advertiser. I don't know what I do. I just throw <laughs> things up in the air and some things stick and some things don't. But the new Mason jar is still going strong. We've had some excellent episodes. We ha just recently had an episode with um, a girl who has taken morning time to nursing homes. Oh, wow. And skilled care facilities. So that was really one of my all-time favorite episodes. And um, we we've just been trying to, uh, we've added a new feature where we have uh, uh, kind of like the literary life of, but instead of it just being all Charlotte Mason people, we are, are talking to moms about how they uh, educate themselves along the way while they're homeschooling. So we have uh, some morning time for moms, uh, side, side uh, episodes here and there. Oh, that sounds excellent. That sounds excellent. And, uh, yeah, so you have been you have been missed. We've been carrying on the best we can without you, but you have definitely been missed. Every now and then, I try like to do a Cindy impersonation, so it, it kind of feels like you know the the spirit of Cindy still hovers over this podcast. I'm still here, but just not as much. <laughs> exactly. And so, Mr. Banks, you've got something exciting coming up this month, though. I do. Yeah, later this month. Uh, no, not this month. Sorry, next month, September. 
at the beginning of September, I will be uh, delivering a webinar uh, about the life and reign and tragedy of Mary Stuart, Mary Queen of Scots, and about the wars and the political intrigues uh, during Reformation era Scotland in the 16th century. And um, I've wanted to do this one for a while just because I I don't get to talk very much about Queen Mary Stuart much in my modern history classes, um, but her life and fate have always, or for a very long time anyway, have interested me um, because, amongst other things, just the sheer melodrama of it, um, mm -hmm. there's her, her life. I, I, I tell my students, like, you read the story of her life, it almost seems like fiction and really bombastic, romantic page turner <laughs> fiction, but it actually happened to someone. Um, so I wanted to, uh, yeah, talk about, um, talk about, uh, what she means in the history of Reformation Europe and the history of Scotland too, because she's a very, very divisive figure in her own country today. Yeah. So, so that'll be, uh, yeah, first week of September. Well, that, that's a very good uh, lead in to today's topic because uh, so many biographies have been written about her. Oh, yeah. I was in this, about in to this, say that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I have read half a dozen, I'm going to say. And um, that's only scratching the surface, honestly. She's a popular um, topic for biographies. Yeah. It's, and it, it's really strange that it's very rare where you find a biographer who can write soberly about her because especially her male biographers tend either to fall in love with her or sort of run away from her as a kind of Jezebel figure mm. who embodies everything, everything objectionable about the, the female half of the human race. It, it's strange. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a polarizing figure. You can find out about that webinar at our website, houseofhumaneletters.com and click on the webinars tab and you can find out all about that. All right. Well, without further ado, if you're new to this podcast, this was this is one of Cindy's genius ideas. So we start off this podcast by sharing a quote from something we've been reading, something from our commonplace. Uh, Cindy, we have we have missed sorely your commonplace quotes. Why don't you get us started? All right. Well, today, obviously, I, I, I should give Thomas one guess where I got my commonplace quote. And do you have any guess what I would have picked for this episode for my commonplace quote? I, for for I this guess, episode, I have guess, I have guess. Miss Stanford, would you like to? I'm going to guess Boswell's Life of Johnson. That was my guess, too, actually. Very good. Well, these are Samuel Johnson quotes, and most oh. of them come from Boswell. And I didn't. Uh, so I have two. I, I couldn't I couldn't decide between them and they're both short. So I got two. And I'll, maybe I can explain. I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one um, because everybody will know why I said this. Um, the true art of memory is the art of attention. Now, Ooh. that's just Charlotte Mason up one side and down the other. And that I talk about that a lot um, in my narration boot camps, but um, this other one I just felt like was so uh, apropos to this whole episode and why we read biographies and um, just where we stand in our culture and what we what it what we need what in our suitcase so to speak um, right this very minute. So here is what uh, Samuel Johnson said. Courage is the greatest of all virtues, because if you haven't courage, you may not have an opportunity to use any of the others. Ooh. I've just thought so much lately about how much courage it takes to be a parent, to be a home educator, or to be even a reader <laughs> in this day and age. It takes a lot of courage. And um, I hope that's one of the things we do. We encourage people to do. Oh, excellent. oh here, here. Yeah. And of course, that biography, uh, Boswell's Life of Johnson, is is that sort of the birth of the modern biography? I would say so. It kind of, it's kind of the quintessential, mm -hmm. yeah, work in its field. I don't, I don't think it's ever been improved upon. Um, and also, I mean, just because he... I mean, I mean, memory being, you know, the art of attention. I think Boswell's book exemplifies that. Um, yeah, kind of, kind of on a heroic level. Uh, just because he, he kind of, it was almost like he, and Boswell is a man without a lot of self-discipline, if you know about his own life. But he really dedicated himself to doing this one thing supremely well, and he 
I mean, kind of focused decades of energies into observing, you know, his subject, observing Johnson in his habitat, his patterns of conversation and his odd mannerisms and and just, you know, personal individuality. And all of it appears in this book. Um, yeah. Interestingly so- enough, when I, I Googled, you know, classic biographies just to see what would come up. And this goes to show how the world changes and how we think Google just tells us everything. It did not come up. I'll let us no. Like John, really? Johnson. No, I had to Google several times to get a list that included Boswell's Life of Johnson. At that point, that was my sole purpose. Like, what is going on here? And almost it's all the biography lists I was find- you. Yeah, I, I thought this is bizarre. Something's weird. Uh, why would this book not be in these lists? And I eventually found it, got it. I mean, I didn't need it. I knew it was there, but I was just like, what? What is going on here? Well, that makes me wonder, like, h- how were they defining for the search term? You know, what were they looking for to define classic biography that that Johnson didn't come up? Because it's well, the- I, I think- yeah, you. I mean, I, I don't want to get into weird conspiracy theories, but I was all over that. I was like, what, you you are blackballing Johnson now or Boswell? It's weird. <laughs> all right, Mr. Banks, do you have a commonplace quote for us? I do. I have one from, I, I've brought him in here several times before. The, uh, the Irish periodical writer and essayist Robert Lind uh, from his book, Things One Hears. Um, He writes, the love of flowers has this advantage over the love of the arts, that it leads to no quarrels of taste. (laughs) Wow. No, that that is, yeah, (laughs) true, I think. I don't know if that's a profound truth, but it is, I think, a observation. Yeah, it kind of stuck with me. It's true. I mean, nobody nobody argues. It's hard to be snobbish about the works of nature, I guess. Unless you go to like some, I don't want to name a grocery store, but, and you know, you're looking at a bunch of carnations that have had dye um, put in them. <laughs> oh yeah. Maybe, maybe that's true. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's a point well taken. All right. Well, my commonplace quote is a, is a, it's a C.S. Lewis quote, but it was quote, I chose it because it was quoted in a biography that I read a few years ago and Really, really enjoyed, and I think a few years ago, actually just raved about it on the podcast several times. It was uh, Alan Jacobs' The Narnian. Um, And one of the reasons I really fell for it is it was unusual in the sense that it was a a biography of C.S. Lewis's imagination um, instead of his life. And I was quite smitten with it. I'm still smitten with it. And so this is a C.S. Lewis quote from that, that biography. Now, the story of Christ is simply a true myth, a myth working on us in the same way as the others, but with the tremendous difference that it really happened. And one must be content to accept it in the same way, remembering that it is God's myth where the others are men's myth. That is, the pagan stories are God expressing himself through the minds of poets, using such images as he found there, while Christianity is God expressing himself through, quote, real things. And that was in a letter to Arthur Greaves on October 18th, 1931. I love that quote. I love that book too. I had read his book. That I, I would concur. That really is a fun one. read that yeah. one. That one was really good. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've yet to read a Jacob's book that I haven't um, found myself admiring. Mm-hmm. I, I agree. I get his newsletter and um, it's always, always fascinating. Well, why don't we start off talking about the role of biography in a literary life in general, and then we can talk about some some particular biographies. So why don't you kick us off with that? Yeah, I, I think that biography as a branch of literature and an art form, um, I think that as with, I mean, maybe as with other branches of literature, it's not one where you have to feel pressured to read everything. I mean, there are a handful of, I think, essential lives that have been written that everyone should do themselves the service of at least tasting, if not reading all the way through. Um, And probably the earliest of these is St. Augustine. Uh, So St. Augustine's Confessions, um, whether or not one is a Christian, is a masterpiece of both literary form and self-examination, you know, the examination of the growth of a soul. 
And I think that it provides the template, which for a long time, other biographers followed, you know, let me examine the growth of a soul towards wisdom or away from wisdom. And which, um, sadly, I think we've kind of lost in a way. Um, what I mean by that, a lot of modern biographies, and I'm not talking about the worst of the lot here, but um, a, a lot of best-selling modern biographies uh, seem to pack their energy into recording every last detail about the life of this particular person as it was materially lived. Um, so one example of that, which is, it, I bring it up because it's it's a you know a critically acclaimed series of books. It's the um, four volume life of Lyndon Johnson by Robert Caro. Okay, <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying you have to go out and run and buy this one. Maybe if like you want to be a good Texan, sure. But like this is this is a four part biography that this author, Robert Caro, dedicated fifty years of his life to writing. Which Isn't is kind there of impressive. one more volume that he didn't finish? Did he finish it finally? Maybe he didn't. I, I, he got four volumes. I think the fourth volume came out maybe 10 years ago. Okay, okay. Maybe he's still working on it. I don't even know. Yeah. My my brother has it. And anyway, I... I, I yeah, it. so my brother in Texas, you know, he has to, he has to be a good Texan. But um, I, I think that a lot of academic biographies, the, the so-called critical biography in from the you know, uh, 20th century onward kind of tells us too much. I don't mean just like yeah. grubby details about a person, but just details which yeah. don't necessarily <laughs> contribute to a sense of what their life meant. So that's what you think a biography should do. It should try to have some- Tell you what a life some meant. Some controlling, yeah. okay, so some mm -hmm. analysis. So I think you need to have like, it needs, yeah, a sort of guiding- I guess the musical term would be leitmotif, sort of to serve as the spine around which the body of the book is built. It's interesting that Johnson, um, that Boswell actually pulled that off because he does have a lot of details in his book. And he is not, I mean, that like he did the advice of Samuel Johnson, so to speak. And yet he very much understands it and gets it across in the book. And we do get the essence of who this man was. Um, in spite of all those details and not, he, he does not make that mistake, even though it's quite a large volume. Yeah. You don't feel that he's just amassing material superfluously because he feels the need to pad his chapters. So yeah, it, yeah, it runs to 700 pages, but I mean, uh, it, it doesn't stand or fall by its sheer length, I suppose. And uh, he, he seems to arrange his material with an artful purpose and design. So yeah, you can write a you can write a long biography like Boswell's, and it's it's a stellar success. Or you can do something on a smaller scale. Any number of Plutarch's lives, um, yeah. I think, are models of the the shorter form. I, I, I think the longest of Plutarch's lives is that of Alexander the Great, which is still only about seventy five pages. And Plutarch doesn't mean to he, he doesn't go out of his way to tell you everything that Alexander the Great, um, you know. Everything that he learned from Aristotle, everything he ate for breakfast while campaigning in Persia, but uh, no, um, he he seems to be more interested, you know, as a guiding theme to uh, show the effects of character upon fate. That that seems perhaps more than anything um, to be what what Plutarch had in mind. Hmm. Yeah. So if if a biography's purpose is to try to make some comment on what a life meant. And that explains why you would want to read lots of bio, lots of versions of the same person, lots of biographies. It's of something I do. I mean, whether, I mean, that, that's a matter of personal taste for me, but I, yeah, I do. Um, and another thing I find kind of bewildering is um, how various the judgments and observations on a single historical life can be. I mean, I mentioned Mary Stewart, but I mean, you could, you could, multiply instances of that. Um, uh, Charles Dickens, I uh, I read, in the last couple of years, I have read two books about Charles Dickens, one of which very admiring, um, you know, the, the classic um, study by G.K. Chesterton from 1912, where Dickens comes across, I mean, not as a perfect man, but someone who is almost, someone who towers above his age, almost like a more a mythic character 
than an individual man. The other one was by an author named, um, oh, what was his name? Hugh Kingsmill, who's writing a, roughly the same time as Chesterton, I think only about 10 or 15 years later. And he presents Dickens as a, essentially a second-rate comic writer who got lucky because of the bad taste of the Victorian, the bad literary taste of his time, who was a social climber and you know, you know, a penny-pinching, you know, controlling father and just kind of a roach generally. So yeah, I, I find that as bewildering as that is, and and kind of you know disappointing sometimes. Um, it also yeah, it shows you that you know a life can inspire both great love and great hatred if you're dealing with a socially eminent person. Sometimes you can really tell more about the biographer by reading the biography than you do about the person. I've oh, read sometimes you certainly can. Yes. Yeah, I read a biography of Nathaniel Hawthorne that was like that. It was just like, wow, you genuinely have an agenda here <laughs> that you can't prove in any way, but you're going to hint at it at, at every turn. Yeah, yeah, where you feel like they're not so much they're not so much examining his, a historical person as they're tearing the skin off of them and um, conducting a not very respectful act of uh, uh, literary dissection for their audience to watch. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, I, and that actually brings up the point that um, I think one of the reasons, I think it's like Lewis says about reading old books. One of the reasons we read biographies is to, is not, I, I think we, right now we're in a cancel culture and we're a debunking culture. And we think nothing of tearing down people um, that we don't like or people that disagree with us. But um, if you read a lot of bi biographies over a long period of time, you you have a big picture of humanity and, 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 and it's, you know, for all of sin, you know, you don't cancel people who are sinners because you're one also. <laughs> And it biographies can give you a picture of of how even scoundrels are sometimes used in ways that are unexpected and amazing because we're all made in the image of God. And I don't know, it just reminds us that people are complicated and not just one sided. And you can't cancel history. You can't cancel who a person was because you're uncomfortable with something they've done or said, because first of all, you you physically can't do it. They actually lived and it's too late, but um, you you do, it, it should open your mind a little bit. It should be mind opening. Okay, that leads me into a question then. So when we talk about the role of biographies in a literary life, let me just start with, and, and you said you've already started to answer that. Why? Why should a person read biographies? Why, why should that be part of my reading life? First, because it's just fun and interesting. It, I mean, I, I mean, for me, biography is one of the most interesting places to read. Um, I remember being a little girl and, and I can see my parents' bookshelf and they had a, a biography of Mary Queen of Scots. I read that. It was a, a little one. It wasn't too deep, but, you know, I think I was rather horrified by her. They, my dad also had a biography of Harry Truman on that shelf, and I read that. And even at that young age, I was I was probably less than twelve. You know, I I was pulled into the these are like they're true myths. We, yes, we don't have the full story, but these biographies are true myths, and they're so much oftentimes even better than stories. Yeah, I think. Uh, for me, the best biographies, at least the ones I love the best, I have some of the same qualities as a really good novel, um, a story that is well framed and well told. And, uh, you know, it might be, you know, have a comic upshot, it might have a tragic upshot. But uh, yeah, uh, being in the presence of people very, very different from oneself living at, you know, far removes in time and space is... Um, I don't know why I find it comforting. I find I find even even a lot of bi historical biographies that you know when you read them you don't necessarily want to trade places with the person but uh yeah finding a common bond of humanity is um yeah for for me anyway that's always kind of a reassuring activity. I I have a fondness for literary biographies. Um biographies of literary figures that talk mm -hmm. about 
their life, but also talk about their work and, and kind of make connections. Uh, uh, I, I tend to, I think I read biographies differently than, than you guys do. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to, if I'm hyper-focusing on something like that one year, I read every Inklings biography that anybody had written because that was just, that was my hyper-focus that year. And I just wanted to know everything. I read the Narnian as part of that. Um, I, I do, and I, I found it interesting, the different perspectives and lenses that people had in examining their lives. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know I've read Jane Austen biographies, Agatha Christie biographies. Here's something. Do you, can you remember which lives of Jane Austen you have read? I read the Lucy Worsley one. Okay. And, Austen at home. Okay. The only one of hers, the only life of her that I have read, honestly, kind of gave the impression that, I mean, her life is her books. And if you like Jane Austen, just read her books. I mean, I, I don't know if that was the author's intention, but uh, yeah. And I like I like literary biographies as well, as well, where, you know, the life of an author is on display because, you know, working about, re reading about their, whatever you want to call it, their creative process, that can be interesting to me. But uh, yeah, some some people like, some of the most interesting people who have ever lived with the liveliest minds had lives which you wouldn't necessarily notice if they were unfolding in front of you. And I think Jane Austen was mm -hmm. kind of kind of one of those. I mean, people who knew her obviously knew that she was a wit and possessed a creative genius, which is hardly to be matched in the history of English letters. But yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a life that was fraught with a lot of noise, a lot of dramatic fire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before the internet came along, if I read a book and I loved it, then I went to the the library and immediately got a biography of the author. Oh, interesting. I did that for years and years and years. And then, of course, the internet, then I just Googled the author. <laughs> right. <laughs> Didn't have right. to read as many biographies, although I still think um, literary biographies are some of the best. Yeah, I mean, I guess I want to make this point since we so often speak on the podcast about not having the biographical fallacy. I, I don't read no. the biographies of an author because I think the key to understanding their work is in their life. Um, you know, I don't I don't think Tolkien's working on his daddy issues or something like that. But uh, in particular, the reason I read the Inklings biographies that year is because I I had started to read about their scholarly essays and I wanted to know a lot more about the context of their lives at Oxford and what they were teaching and kind of in our office politics and that kind of stuff. And so it provided a, a really good context, but like for something like for Jane Austen, um, I like reading about that time period a lot. And so I, I just wanted to know like what her daily life was. So finding out that she had spent a lot of time in Bath, she didn't really enjoy it. She thought it was kind of, you know, the Vegas. It's true in Northanger yeah, Abbey. It's, it's, like, it's, like the, it's like yeah. Las Vegas of England. I, yeah. I thought, oh, okay, that, that definitely explains an attitude I see in her books, that kind of thing. Um, it, it just gave me, I guess, a bigger picture of her life, um, particularly that she lived on the, the welfare of her brothers. There was some interesting stuff about her struggles to get published and to be treated fairly by publishers. Uh, she, you know, I found out that she was a lot more um, feisty and fighting for things than I would have thought she was. And I mean, that doesn't change the way I read her books, of course, but you know, I, I like her, I admire her. I, I was interested in that. But I'm also reminded, so my dad was a great, great reader of biographies and, um, I remember him remarking to me at some point that he enjoyed reading biography even more than history. And he read a lot of history because he he felt like a biography gave you history in the context of a person's life. That made a big impression on on me. What, what do y'all think about that? Biography. Oh, I think I, uh, Disraeli, I think, said that. I think it was Benjamin Disraeli said that um, biography is history distilled. Mm. And I, th I think there's something to that, yeah. And I, um, I know one series of books that was published by, I think it was, the Collins imprint in the 1950s and 60s. It was edited by the historian um, A. L. Rouse, and it was teaching yourself history through the lives of certain key players who had lived through it. So it's there's, for instance. Um, William the Conqueror and 
um, the Norman invasion of England. There's um, Thomas Cranmer and the English Reformation, where it's kind of half one chapter of the person's life will be succeeded by a picture of the times and the movements and the conflicts that they lived in. Um, so yeah, I, I like I like the use of biography for those purposes. In fact, I, I will say the only th there are basically two subgenres or whatever you want to call it of biography, which I positively don't like. One is of contemporary figures who are still living. Yeah, I, I really don't like that. So like when when like a the twenty five year old celebrity who writes a memoir that okay <laughs> that kind of thing that's just no um, that sets my teeth on edge. Another is. Um, it's kind of funny to think that it's sort of old fashioned now, but it, this was a huge thing in like the 19, from about the thirties through the fifties when Freudian psychoanalysis was all the rage, but the psychobiography, um, that was popularized by a German author named Emil Ludwig, um, who like, I, I don't know if he had like some kind of mind reading device, but he sort of thought he could, he could think himself into the unrecorded thoughts of, Goethe and Napoleon and Bismarck and others. And there's um kind of the reductio ad absurdum of this subgenre was by a uh, a psychologist and amateur note, amateur historian named Eric Erickson, who wrote a book called Young Man Luther in oh, this is about 1960. And uh he decided that all of Luther's theological interests and obsessions, his defiance of the Pope, his, you know, setting in, setting in motion of the Protestant Reformation was based on his resentment of his father, <laughs> Hans Luther, who had beaten him too often as a child or something like that. Because who what is the Pope but a projection of one's own father? So that so you like that's that's like Bloom had a lot of you could yeah, it's it you could say that Harold, yeah. I don't know if Harold well, that, that kind of brings you around to like the Hillary Mantle books and books like that that are historical fiction, but they're based around real events. Like they are kind of doing that, um, putting words in people's mouth, giving them thoughts, um, trying to put the history in context. But they are fiction. They, you know, they yeah, are. like a novelist doing that kind of thing. I am willing to grant a certain like creative leeway to that. I mean, I, I enjoy Hillary Mantle. I think Hillary Mantle. May she rest in peace. Was a enormously gifted novelist. Um, but when a uh, another uh, author, uh, Herbert Gorman, he wrote a life, one of the lives of Mary, Queen of Scots, which I was looking at recently. And um, he's another psychobiographer, or whatever you want to call it. And when she's about to be executed, um, and he does not refer to any document or any recorded saying, but uh, she's, 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 she, he's imagining her, you know, in her last moments alone where she's praying that she will die well. And he says she was, her mind kept turning from thoughts of God to the sharpness of the ax. No one tells us this at all, but somehow like if the biographer claims to know a unspoken thought of his or her subject that like that sort of thing makes me want to throw a book across the room mm -hmm. I feel like um, we needed to add some tension to her impending execution yeah it's yeah i mm, yeah that kind of thing bothers me so yeah psychobiography and uh contemporary lives because uh, you know lives of which we don't know the shape because they're not over so we can't speak to their final significance those are those are avenues that i don't care to explore very much other than that though i'm I'm open to a wide variety of schools of, uh, you know, biographical treatment. What's the difference between a memoir and a biography? I guess a memoir would be a chapter of life or a um, literary reflection on a certain part of someone's past. So, well, I do think there's a lot. I think that a memoir is a part is part biography or part autobiography. Yeah. Actually, yeah. so it isn't full biography, um, but it definitely it definitely fits under that genre, just as like a, uh, a, a yes yeah, subcategory of it. Sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, they are related, certainly. I I, I guess um, a memoir, I think, is being having a more miniature quality about it. 
like when someone like uh uh what's his name frank mccourt writes a, a story of his mother he he's kind of writing a memoir of his life but he's telling the story his mother's story and it's it's a non-fiction book uh angela's ashes it's a beautiful story but you know what it what is it you know it's if it, it's a story it's a biography it's a memoir it kind of uh, crosses a lot of lines. And I think that does get kind of tricky. Uh, you have your straight up biographies, you have your memoirs, you have your autobiographies, and then you have letters, like pe books of letters, that kind of thing. It can get, there's a lot going on in this in this area. I had forgotten, thank you for reminding me of that. I had, I had forgotten about Angela's Ashes. Th that was a generous book. And I, I think it's kind of the exception to the rule, but I, I have thought for, well, I won't say a long time, but I, I've occasionally wondered if, if children shouldn't be by law prohibited from writing a memoir or biography of their <laughs> I, I'm parents. I'm for that. I'm for that law. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because I mean, I, again, I mean, like Angela's Ashes, I mean, that was a beautiful, that, that was a work of art. I mean, it art, was a very like, it's kind of, book. Yeah. But it was like kind of the exception. Because it seems yeah. like a lot of kids write books about their parents to take posthumous revenge on them. Mommy dearest. Yeah. Yes, exactly. That would be like kind of the low end of that sort of thing. But yes, exactly. Right. The, let me. No, I just want to say right now, if any of my kids write a book about me, that it's not true. <laughs> Morning time, dearest. <laughs> More tales from the dark morning time. <laughs> no, we had a conversation not that long ago. Remember about how in the 80s, in the 1980s, there just seemed to be this boom of biographies by celebrity children that were just to talk smack about their parents. Yeah. 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 yeah there's still some of the, like, I, I know one of Ronald Reagan's children did that to him about, I think it must have been about 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there, there really should be a law about this kind of thing. Okay, so thankfully, they're all on TikTok now, and that just like disappears in three or four seconds. So you don't have to. <laughs> but okay, it sounds like we can make a distinction then between a kind of biography that's almost a type of voyeurism, like almost yes. like a tabloid oh, yes. kind yeah. of thing versus versus what? Go ahead. What What's the difference between kind of the celebrity tabloid biography kind of tell all uh, oh, like versus? I think there's just having a, a purely sensationalistic intention as opposed to inviting a reader to sit down soberly and contemplate what what this life has amounted to for good, for evil, not asking them to approve or disapprove of everything, but just kind of um, as lucidly and as uninterferingly as possible, setting forth the materials of this or that life. As opposed to here, let me let me show you all of their dirty laundry and then some. So so that comes up a lot in Christian biography, where what is a true Christian biography? Is it, you know, it, there's a fine line between airing dirty laundry and um telling the truth. Also, like it, we it, there there, I think there was a period of time where it was we're whitewashing all these Christian people because as if they were, you know, otherworldly in a, in a way in, in the biographies. I think now we see a trend towards, then there was the other trend towards, you know, just talking about how horrible they were. <laughs> and um, that I think a true biography has to see between all of that. You know, I'm, I'm still thinking about what you said at the very beginning, Thomas, when, you, you know, that a biography is not telling the story of a life it's trying to say what a life meant that i feel like that that changes what i think about biography and and i think it changes the conversation too and this fits to what cindy is saying i think i think some people will read older biographies and criticize it because well it didn't say x y and z about them in their private life but the biography wasn't trying to say everything about that person's life. So let's say it's a policy, a founding father. Let's give that as an example. Mm -hmm. um, and they're trying to shape a story that this person's life meant X, Y, and Z to the United States in terms of, you know, they, the constitution and certain liberties that we have, then they wouldn't get into, this is how he treated his mother when he was 16, or this is how, you know, he wasn't a great husband or, cause it's not a biography. Yeah. Of, it's not the story of a great husband. Mm -hmm. It's not even the story of a great boss. Might right. not even be the story of a great president. It's just an important the story of a, a significant figure. 
Yeah, that was, um, oh, I mean, I, 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 another example, I read, um, I read a couple different lives of Louis the 14th, one of which dealt almost entirely with his public life with, um, his rule as, you know, this, this almost superhuman absolute monarch who was both admired and feared all over Europe, um, you know, imitated, you know, even by his enemies and, and, you know, his palace design and that kind of thing. It said almost nothing about his domestic life. Um, the other one, well, almost ent entirely on the, I guess you could say sort of the interiority of his life, like, and dealt with little details, like, and it was actually very interesting. Um, seating precedence at the dinners at Versailles. Okay, I would eat that up. Okay, because I think, so Philip, uh, excuse me, um, Louis's younger brother, um, uh, Philippe, his wife was annoyed that they were not seated more eminently in the grand dining hall and uh, asked her brother to write to the king, you know, write to your older brother about this to complain. And Louis responded through one of his secretaries that, look, I honestly would like to see you closer to me also, but this is like, you know, this is sort of the customs, the formalities as we've inherited them, and we have to respect past precedent, and this or that duke or duchess would be offended if you were moved up and they were not. So if I move one person up, I have to do the same for everyone. And it's it's ridiculous how even like dinner involved politicking and scheming and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's actually a great interest of mine is customs and manners. So I like mm -hmm. reading biographies uh, or, or social histories that will have those kinds of details uh, just to satisfy my curiosity um, as a reminder that our customs and manners of this time are relatively new and who's to say this is how we should be acting. But also because I have such a great love of literature, when I read a biography that explains customs like that, I feel like then when I read the older book, it, some scenes make more sense to me. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, as a modern reader, I might not pick up on all the nuances of where everybody's sitting on the table, how this is, you know, this is, there's a hierarchy here. Another thing, yeah, also I think appreciating the difference in physical conditions. And mm -hmm. we, all, we all know that, yeah, they didn't have as much technology as us, but um, the, uh, oh, he's a famous Protestant, uh, Carl Truman. He's a Protestant pastor and also a historian by trade. He said, when you're reading about any part of the distant past, whether it's the Reformation or the Crusades or whatever, you have to think, you have to bear in mind, it's not the most important thing, but always remember that none of these people was in really great health as we understand great health. And unless you're a extraordinarily robust person living in 16th century France or Germany, probably you'll always be a little bit uncomfortable. And appreciating details like that, I think that's that's another another part of um, you know the discipline of reading biographies that I. I appreciate personally. Yeah, I also like little details about food preparation and food storage and food yeah. like stuff. Just like even reading a biography in which, as a passing remark, they pointed out that they never ate like salads or raw vegetables or because there was oh, of course not. because of disease you had to boil everything mm -hmm. um to make sure it was healthy, which of course destroys the nutritional value. And uh, you know, I just I, I find things like that so interesting. But I want to get I want to go back to what Cindy was saying about showing every detail of a person's life versus whitewashing. I feel like that's a that's a very contentious topic right now. And as you're choosing biographies to read for yourself, as you're choosing biographies to read, you know, in a classroom or with your students, that comes up a lot in terms of what makes a truthful biography. So where is the line between apotheosis, basically treating people as if they're, you know, angels on earth or saints, and also exposing, you know, every little dirty thing they ever did? Actually, since since Cindy brought up Samuel Johnson, Samuel Johnson, who, I mean, he wrote the lives of the poets, which are biographies in miniature kind of, of the English poets. He said to Boswell on one occasion that he felt that it was the duty of a biographer, no matter how much he admires his subject, to expose some some failure or other, lest people be falsely drawn into the impression that this man really was an angel or a god walking amongst men and should despair of imitation. <laughs> um, and 
Boswell, it's kind of funny, Boswell then says, later Dr. Johnson contradicted himself by saying, he, he, I, guess, I guess he changed his opinion at some point and said that, no, really, I mean, you know, especially when you're dealing with things that would embarrass a dead person, you shouldn't, you shouldn't mention those. And uh, so I guess... Boswell kind of puts the first principle into practice right there that's saying that, yeah, Johnson, sometimes he changed his mind randomly and could contradict himself. He wasn't like the most consistent man. But anyway, I, I, I kind of appreciate that. And he does. Yeah. I mean, for instance, Boswell allows that Johnson was sometimes ungenerous in conversation and debate. So, for instance, um, Edmund Burke and he were once in some some argument about the American colonies. Burke was willing to allow that the American colonies and seceding from Britain had some just grievances. Johnson thought that it was basically ungrateful children who were disowning their parents and also, by the way, not extending the goods of liberty to slaves, amongst others. And um, Boswell remarked that Johnson won, quote unquote, the debate by just not letting Burke talk uh, and and um, Burke remarked, I think it was Burke anyway, remarked afterwards that sometimes Johnson, when his pistol misses fire, takes it by the barrel and clubs you with it. Yeah, so even when he doesn't have a good debate, he'll just, you know, a good case to make, he'll beat you to death with it by kind of shouting you down. So, but I mean, Boswell in his depiction of Johnson, I, I think he shines more light on his virtues and his generous qualities as a man. Um, than his his you know various faults, which obviously we all have. Cindy, you have some thoughts about that? I was trying to think. I'm trying to find the title uh, of the author's name of the up uh, the recent biographies of Elizabeth Elliot, where I think the author did a really good job. Elizabeth El Elliot has become kind of a controversial figure uh, because uh, people disagree with you know some of the principles that she lived her life by, which you know. Nevertheless, this was a woman who lived her life by those principles. And her biographer uh, has two books. One is Becoming Elizabeth Elliot, and the next one is Being Elizabeth Elliot. And um, she, she I, and I was really nervous about reading them because I really didn't want to read an expose of Elizabeth Elliot where we, you know, see all her faults and everything terrible about her and, and basically... Uh, you know, undo everything good that, you know, she might have done because we're, we're going to expose her. And I just felt like this girl did such a great job of not doing that. At the same time, I think she masterfully showed us pieces of the puzzle and let us come to our own conclusions. And I thought that was, I, I, I thought it was amazing. I, it was amazing that um, it wasn't a whitewash and it wasn't, a, a tr you know, she wasn't trashing Elizabeth Elliot. She was really honestly just showing us the picture and letting uh, our own minds come to our own conclusions. And I think that is part of being a good biographer, um, not necessarily concluding anything, but just telling the story, telling, obviously, as Tom says, there should be an overarching theme um, you, or you're all over the place or you're going to, you know, have the seven volumes on the life of, you know, some obscure person. But um, at the same time, I do think it's it, it's there's such a great trust people can have in the reader to to see, you know, what's going on without having to spell everything out in a way that is um, kind of debunking, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Um... I think the mark of a good biography is that it, even if its subject matter is kind of dark and on the side of pessimism, it doesn't seem as though the author is gratuitously trying to make his audience more cynical. Yes, yes. Because um, there's, yeah. there's too much of that already anyway. Actually, I love in um, in C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters when the more experienced devil is writing to his junior protege, he encourages um, he encourages him to... Uh, try to tempt his subject into reading all sorts of modern biographies where the people are just going through phases and their lives don't really mean anything. Um, mm. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was amazing to me on these, I said classic biographies, and I don't get one classic book. I get only 
uh, modern biographies that have been written in the last 15 years. Um, it's as if nothing ever happened before that. Um, and, and for on modern people, like you're saying. So what about what about biographies in the literary life of children? I think there used to be a market for this, and I don't know if there are there is any more. I, I don't really keep up with the children's book market, but I had a series of books when I was a kid, and I think they I think they were one of my parents. I always remember them just being around the house. Um, it was the Meet So and So series. I think it was like, oh, like yeah. the nineteen forties and fifties, yeah, maybe. House. Meet, yep. Random yeah. House, yes. Meet Thomas yeah. Jefferson. Yeah, and yeah. like there was one for like several of the presidents, and meet, meet I, I think John was... F. Kennedy is on my shelf right this minute because it. I I replaced that because I had that as a child, and I just would pour over that book because yeah. it had photographs that were so fascinating. Those were like the little kid version of the landmark books that were also produced by Random House. Yes, actually, yes, that's a good comparison. It was the same series. Yeah. yeah, I like those a lot. I actually, I think that was probably, uh, and I had a kid's biography of John Bunyan, um, which I don't remember who produced it. I think it must have been written in like the 70s or 80s. It had those kind of bad illustrations. I really liked it though. Um, and uh, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I, I guess like condensed biographies were a part of my childhood. And I don't know if that particular type of children's writing is really a thing anymore. I honestly no, don't. No, well, 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 if you take something like The Childhood of Famous Americans, which was very much a story based. Uh, it really was basically saying, here's here's how Mary Todd Lincoln might have lived. You know, she would be sewing her sampler. She would be, you know, go helping milk the cows or, you know, they uh, the Childhood of Famous American books um, had facts and had things like their brothers and their sisters. And but they were not, you know, straight up um, biographies, but they were very well written. I read all of those as a child. And I mean, all the ones I could find at my library and I would just go to the library and look for those. And I read all of them. And that honestly, I believe that the, it's like Nancy Drew for literature. I think it started me on a life of reading biographies. I enjoyed them so much. And I really started to like certain people in history like Dolly Madison and Mary Todd Lincoln, even though later, you know, I read some biographies of Mary Todd Lincoln that, we're like, whoa. She's Hers was a really tragic life. Yes, I really think. sad. Very I mean, sad. Didn't she outlive, mo I'm going to say most of her children? I think so. And I she know one of them, probably had a mental illness. And, uh, yeah, there, there's that as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But anyway, those now everything, we, we have a lot of books now that, that um, are really based on just didactic knowledge. Um, of different people. And some of those are still, it's hard to make a person uninteresting because a biography is one area where it's hard to write a bad biography as far as like a children's biography, because people are interesting and you can, you can tell about them and it can be fascinating. And especially if there's someone living a different life to, than, than what you've ever seen. I think a lot of modern biographies for children are all contemporary uh, times, like people that, um, you know, that the child would hear about or see in regular life and not so much um, going back in history, but there are some mm -hmm. out there. I would, yeah, I, my children really liked those. I, I collected the Childhood of Famous Americans and I co collected the meet so-and-so books of Random House that Mr. Banks was talking about. And um, I also have a very large collection of the Landmark biographies, which was yeah. a series in the 1950s of children's biographies. I mean, what a great project. They hired all these top-notch adult historians to to write really qu high-quality uh, children's biographies. And it's just a, it's really a remarkable series. Um, so I started collecting those and then I started, and I, I don't know if I... I don't know if I read this on your blog a million years ago, Cindy, or something, Charlotte Mason, but somewhere along the way, um, I think in the early days of homeschooling my kids, I was like really meticulously trying to line up if this was the history topic, I was going to make sure we had, you know, X, yeah. Y, and Z picture book about that topic. And somewhere along the way, I got rid of that and just started giving my kids biographies. I had, we had a whole shelf um, or several shelves. And then they, they were just allowed to read anything they wanted off of the biography. And, 
I was just really delighted to see the way that they learned history from biography and the way that they would have to mentally put together the time period from reading all the different lives. And uh, yeah, that was very exciting for me. I became a big fan of teaching history to kids through biography after that. Um, one of my kids in particular still really just prefers reading things like biography and, and nonfiction. And, yeah. and um, I think for me, Mr. Banks doesn't really listen to audiobooks, but I'm curious about you, Cindy. I find biography something that makes a really good audiobook. Oh, absolutely. I mean, obviously the the narrator matters, but um, I think biography is a great choice for an audiobook. Yeah, I'm not because if I'm just reading, let's I mean a straight history book or a or a, a literature book, I I have to stop and take notes. Right. But biography, I can just I can just let that play. You're just getting the feel for the person's life. You're not trying to examine it closely. Um, yeah, there was uh, there are some excellent audio books out there that are about, after I read the Elizabeth Elliot biographies, I got really into it's funny because you asked me to do this because um, I had not read a lot of biographies in the last few years. I mean, I, of course, the inkling stuff I'd been reading all along or um, Dorothy Sayers or, you know, Flannery O'Connor, some of those biographies. But I would, had not been deep diving into a lot of biographies in a, several years and I read that Elizabeth Elliot biography and I got so excited. Then I went out and got a Eugene Peterson biography. And then I went and got um, a Tim Keller biography. The Eugene Peterson biography, if you're, if you're interested, was so good. <laughs> it was another really good biography. And since then, I've really put biographies front and center again in my reading because um, even though those were Christian books, it's nice as a Christian to read of Christians who struggle, then it's kind of nice they're not whitewashed that we can say, oh, he struggled with that too, you know, and yet, you know, he kept walking with the Lord. That's a really encourage another encouraging thing about biography. So, but I, I did all of that on audio. Um, the PG Wood, the Francis Donaldson's uh, PG Woodhouse is a great audio book also. And, you know, you know, it's just a lovely life and you enjoy spending time with him during those chapters. Mm -hmm. Do you have some recommendations for people, both of you? Like well, somebody wants to jump in with biographies. We've already mentioned a few, but Mr. Banks, if you, if you have to direct um, some okay, biographies. Okay. Ones I know I have on my shelf that I enjoy. I enjoy, uh, he, he's mainly a novelist, but he wrote some very, very accomplished historical lives as well. Uh, John Buchan, uh, he wrote lives of Augustus Caesar, um, Julius Caesar, Walter Scott, uh, Montrose, the Scotch cavalier hero, and actually Oliver Cromwell as well. Uh, it's interesting, he wrote back-to-back -back biographies of Montrose and Cromwell, each of which is more admiring than not, I would say, even though they were on opposite sides of the English Civil War. So I, I think that John Buchan is a good example of a biographer who is careful in his methods, graceful in his presentation of material, and generous to his subjects, no matter who they are. Um, I also have a number of Hilaire Belloc's historical biographies. Um, he wrote... Um, he wrote a life, uh, one I like is his life of Cardinal Richelieu, because he really doesn't like Richelieu that much. I have but that book, yeah, but I've never a, read it. <laughs> it's an interesting book. It's, um, yeah, I mean, he, he sees Richelieu as a very accomplished political genius who was, who really loved his country and kind of made a religion of making France great at perhaps some cost to his own soul. But it's, yeah, it's an interesting, it's a very interesting picture of both the man and the times he lived in. How about you, Cindy? You've got some, uh, some, some favorite. Well, yeah, I have a lot of biographies. I, I, I try to think back just for interest sake over some books, some, some biographies that I remember enjoying for a long period of time. One of those, which I'm pretty sure we've mentioned here before is Linda Lear's uh, biography of Beatrix Potter, which, um, it, uh, it's called A Life in Nature, and it, it could just be as long as it wanted to be. You were transported to the Lake District, and you live there on the farm with Beatrix Potter drawing. It is such, it is really one of the best biographies that um, I've ever read. And I had a blast when I first got married reading some of the Russian 
biographies that um, Robert Macy did, um, Nicholas and Alexandra. Oh, yes. I know I those. loved, I went down a long rabbit hole of, uh, I, I was going to name my first daughter. Thankfully, it took me a long time to Anastasia. And um, my, my, my niece ended up getting to name her daughter that but um, I just I was so into all of that. And I and I still remember well that biography and I've read that was probably 40 years ago. I adored I love David McCullough, which is, you know, no surprise, but um, his um, Mornings on Horseback about Teddy Roosevelt, I thought that was one of those. Um, that was one that I gave to all my, my kids to read. I think that's a great book for them to read in um, junior or high school. Yeah, um, I, I feel sorry for anyone who's going to write a life of either John Adams, Truman, or Roosevelt after McCullough, because, yes. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean, like, McCullough is another example of a, I, I read one or two of his books, I, actually, I don't think I finished the John Adams, anyway, it doesn't matter, but you feel that he, again, has researched his subject thoroughly, he's saying what he has to say at considerable length, but I don't remember feeling that this guy's just wasting pages here, is he being paid by word count or something, but, so yeah, he writes on a, on a monolithic scale, but not, not in a dull fashion at all, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love his writing. I've read his, some of his historical, other historical books are very good. And, Anything else? I don't want to cut you off. Um, I, You know what a, a biography I love? Another one that I give to the kids, and I know people are looking for stuff like that, is A Man Called Peter by Catherine Marshall. Um, she She's the one who wrote the Christie book. Uh, well, the Christie books. Christie. She wrote Christy, and um, she has a book about her husband, Peter Marsh Marshall, who was a Scotsman who became the um, the chaplain to the United States Senate as a, and a pastor. And it's such a down to earth look at a man who you think is a kind of fancy guy who lives in this fancy time, but in, in, is in Washington. And it was nothing like that. It was just the just such a beautiful picture of a pastor. Oh, that's very good. Yeah, those are all those are all stellar examples. Um, yeah, I I I don't read as many biographies as you guys, but I I do enjoy biographies. The Narnian by Alan Jacobs. Oh, sorry, I should, I've forgotten anything by Antonia Fraser. Yes, and, and she's written yes. about a lot of different people. I just I mean, she's, well, her Mary Queen of Scots is kind of the yeah that the that's standard. that's the the life. I don't think it's ever going to be improved on in English. Um, but. I read a book of hers that you gave me about Lady Caroline Lamb, mm -hmm. which she just wrote this last year. And yeah, that was her latest one. She's ninety years old or something like that, and she can still she can still bring it. She's um yeah. Again, you, you feel that she's been through all the archives and have written every diary entry and letter about whoever it is. You know, she's she's taken as her subject, um, but she doesn't feel the need to tell everything, and I I appreciate that. So the Narnian by Alan Jacobs stands out for me in that it was a very unusual biography. Like I said, it's a, it's a biography of his imagination. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which which was re really good. And biographies tend to be long and I think overwhelming. Uh, but but Chesterton's biographies are not long. So his Dickens, his Chaucer, his on Robert Louis Stevenson. Those are those are small volumes. Chesterton also. I mean, that's one part of his literary output that I don't think gets as much attention. Um, but yeah, he uh, his biographies are always again everything he writes is like epigrammatically brilliant and full of, full of one liners. Um, one thing he does not do, I don't think he ever gives references in any of his biographies, so like they're not cluttered with footnotes or anything like that. And he seems usually more interested in the times his character lived in mm -hmm. than in the character himself, almost. Yeah, the, the Chaucer one in particular, Chaucer's like that, I think, yeah. is really, but it's got that great chapter on the medieval imagination and explaining about mm -hmm. originality as a Yeah, I think it's stronger concept. almost as literary criticism mm -hmm. than as biography. I love that book, though. Yeah. I, I've given it to more than one person. We don't know a ton about Chaucer's life, to be fair. Yeah. We know, yeah. We know very little. Uh, but yeah, so they don't More all have than to we be know good. of Shakespeare, but not like yeah. a whole ton. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, any final comments about biographies from you guys before we wrap this episode up? Read more of them. Avoid celebrity biographies. Avoid tell all biographies. And yeah, and, and um, yeah, and I guess what, what else we, we said? Um, books about children by their parents or well, about parents I, by I their disagree. children. I disagree. I <laughs> disagree. 
You read a couple really silly celebrity biographies. Well, put I, mean, I read the one by Prince Harry. No, I, I'm not. I, I'm saying this is someone who read, read The Hammer of the Gods, The Lives of Led Zeppelin more than <laughs> once, I admit it. So I, I've read, yeah, I, I actually read like a lot of pop. We're not going to tell you what life. celebrity biographies we've read, but we yeah. we we have a few for, the, for uh, you know, just when you're, you just can't think anymore. <laughs> so... <laughs> Cindy, it is so good to have you back on the podcast. It really is. Yeah. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed it. It's always fun. And this is a great topic. I love this topic. Well, we hope that you guys at home, um, uh, you know, got some good stuff to think about as a result of this episode. It's a question we get a lot. What about biographies? What's the role? And how do I know if a biography is good? That, that's a question we get a lot. I think people worry about, am I reading a good one? But it sounds like you just need to read broadly. And and not expect that a biography is going to tell you everything. Uh, so I, you know, I think, biography I think that's- is a great book to put down if it's not tracking with you in some way. I mean, there's a few like you know Johnson. You really Boswell. You have to stick with it. The first it gets off to a very slow start, uh, but then um, it, once it takes off, it's well worth the the effort. But um, not all biographies are like that. And like Thomas said earlier, sometimes they're great for just dipping into, but um, you know, you know, for kids, the Ralph Moody books are basically biographies too. So mm. those are great, great stories. Sorry. That's completely off topic. Here. No, not at all. Not at all. Everybody's got their notebooks out and they're taking notes. I'm sure. Uh, well, well, thanks so much for joining us, Cindy. And thanks uh, for you at home for joining us for this episode. And next week, we're going to do a best of. We're going to uh, rebroadcast The Literary Life of Joan Rose, which was an episode a lot of people found very encouraging. And then after that, we'll start our September series on Dorothy Sayers' Murder Must Advertise. So I'll be sending out the schedule for that soon. You'll want to get on our mailing list at houseofhumanletters.com if you're not already to get that schedule. We'll post it also on our Patreon and on Facebook. Uh, so uh, until next time, uh, we'll, get, we'll uh, Cindy, carry on sabbaticalizing. <laughs> Thank you. I will. <laughs> um, and I hope you get your cozy winter nap that you request after your, your long, hard summer. Uh, and we'll be back next week with the literary life of Joan Rose and our fall schedule. So until then, keep crafting your literary life because stories will save the world. Thank you for listening to the Literary Life Podcast, brought to you by our loyal Patreon sponsors. Visit houseofhumaneletters.com to find Angelina and Thomas and to sign up for our newsletter with podcast schedules and more. And keep up with Cindy at morningtimeformoms.com. Join the conversation at our member-only Patreon forum or our Facebook discussion group. Visit patreon.com backslash the literary life to find out how you can sponsor this podcast and get great bonus content. Don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review, and check out our sister podcasts, The New Mason Jar and The Well-Read Poem. And now for a poem read by poet Thomas Banks. Aftermath by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. When the summer fields are mown, when the birds are fledged and flown, and the dry leaves strew the path, with the falling of the snow, with the cawing of the crow, once again the fields we mow and gather in the aftermath. Not the sweet new grass with flowers is this harvesting of ours, not the upland clover bloom, but the rowan mixed with weeds, tangled tufts from marsh and meads, where the poppy drops its seeds in the silence and the gloom.